In our last video, we uncovered a hidden gem in testosterone replacement therapy. There's an ester that's flying under the radar, but might just be the best kept secret for optimizing your levels. When it comes to testosterone injections, the method you choose to do that injection can make all the difference. There's lots of talk about subcutaneous or intramuscular or even shallow IM as a technique for injecting yourself, but which is the best one for you? Are you struggling with sexual health issues or libido? The real culprit might be lurking in your brain. Low dopamine levels may be the culprit for your low mood and libido. But is prolactin also the villain that's keeping your dopamine down? Don't miss this crucial discussion. Keep watching. So, you know, with all the different esters for testosterone out there, you know, Cypionate seems to be the one that everyone's talking about. You know, and I, my theory is that Cypionate is because that's really the mainstay in the USA. And all of the attention about TRT and hormone optimization is usually originating in the USA. And I don't know if you, you, you know that uh, in, in the UK, the uh, licensed products, products that are similar to FDA approval would be Sustanon, testosterone enanthate, testosterone and decanoate are, are, are the mainstay. However, there's no commercially available testosterone propionate that's part of the, the UK license, but it's still on the books as under the MHRA. But there's also propionate you know, at our clinic, at our pharmacy, we import from Europe. And some of the issues of testosterone propionate that, that people have had in the past in the USA, especially with compounded testosterone propionate, is the fact that you, you can complain burning and sting or very painful injection or post-injection. But that's, that's the US version. There is one. So I, mean, I was to say, what if I told you there was a testosterone propionate commercially available form, then probably doesn't, you don't feel anything. It, it's probably more comfortable than testosterone cypionate. And then there is one, mm. and it's, it's a product that we import from Italy. It's uh, 25 milligrams in one mil. And, you know, I think some of the, the scientific reasons for the burning and stinging in some of formulations is they make it just too concentrated or they right. put too much benzyl alcohol in it. Uh, this particular right. version has olive oil and a non-benzyl alcohol uh, preservative. And, you know, it soon as we'll have no preservative at all. You know, it'll just be... Uh, the olive oil excipient, maybe with some ethyl olease and the testosterone, and it'll be one unit, one dose, as they all are in ampules. So a lot of people in America don't know that, but in reality, it's that for our lucky clients in, in the UK, we have testosterone propionate that doesn't burn or sting. And I can attest to that because in recent times, my prescription was changed to 25 milligrams or, or by 20 to 25 milligrams daily of testosterone propionate. Because I know lots of people on the channel have asked, well, Mike, what do you what are you prescribed? What were you taking? And, and that's uh, new for me because I've, for years, have been using Sustanon. I would pre prescribe Sustanon, you know, anywhere from one, two, five every five days to 50 milligrams every three days to every variation uh, around that. All this talk about the testosterone propionate in some, in some areas and, and some people, and I wanted to, to kind of experience what, what some of our patients would experience and see if it's possible, if it's feasible. Because I didn't really, you know, relish the thought of doing a daily injection. Initially, you know, worked with a doctor and, and, and tried every 36 hours. But could you, you know, it's just a little more difficult to, to time 36 hours, you know, in your calendar. It doesn't map out very easily. And well, you can like do it one evening, then you know, in the, the morning, and then, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. So then I just thought it may just be easier to just go daily. And over time, we've reduced the dose to down about 20, 20 milligrams. And I'm, I've got another video where we made showing uh, how to do that. Because I know in the US, everyone is doing shallow intramuscular. They're using it all in, into a needle. But here in the, in the UK, we're using, you know, we got the one ml syringes from BD. Uh, they're yeah. very smooth. And then you, you draw it out with a, uh, a filter needle to remove all the glass particles. So those are some of the differences. Okay. Well, it goes up, but it goes down like all of them do. And, and I've got a lot of book behind the, the pharmacokinetics of, of testosterone and you all see the, the graphs, which I think are just uh, algorithms or kind of projections. And, and some, of them, some of them, I think, were based on dosing uh, 25 milligrams and also 50 milligrams of, of testosterone propionate and, all, and, and the other esters, is that I think we see the initial dose of test prop 25 milligrams reaching around 40 nanomolars per liter. So yeah, I think it was okay. around a thousand and, and then falling back down. But after subsequent dosing, I think it gets up to about 50 nanomolars per liter. 
which isn't yeah. necessarily high because we've seen some patients who have you know natural levels around 37 nanomolars per liter, right? Yeah. Um, you know, my, my younger brother, for instance, came, he's, you know, he's a big yoga, yoga guy, and um, he, he sees levels of uh, you know, 37, 38 nanomolars per liter, which, which is a level for, for being natural. Sure. Also, the caveat is sometimes when you have high natural levels, you can also follow with high SHBG. So we, I've seen, and, and in my own levels, uh, when I've gone the next day to do the test, I, I'll see levels about 27 or 30 nanomolars per liter, um, you know, 900,000 kind of, kind of uh, or is it just, just too much going on, too much uh, androgen re receptor? I mean, because you, you, know, you, you reach a saturation point on the androgen receptor to where you know, right. it's not going to have any more gene expression once it's really saturated. Oh, yes. Even though some in, in the bodybuilding world, the thought is more is better, and then you, right. you kind of see these guys seem to put on a lot of muscle mass, but there's many other factors that go into that. So I, I couldn't imagine it's just, I mean, to a point after you, you reach this, this level, you can see much more benefit from the, from the androgen. There's a very subtle difference on it and off of it. And, uh, you know, I've said, you know, publicly, I've got a varicose seal. And so we really? H HCG. Is it always great with the varicose And there are some studies about if you can do, like, you block it off with foam uh, or the varicose seal removed or, or something embolized, uh, it, 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 it may reduce the risk of BPH, et cetera, because one of the theories that's come out a few years ago that uh, varicose seals may lead to higher levels of BPH and oversaturate uh, the, the prostate with direct androgens coming from, uh, from the testes. You're aggravating it with HCG and getting the testes into te testicular testosterone, you may then be getting this much more concentrated, potent, unfiltered uh, uh, androgens uh, if you're washing over the, the prostate. Now, that was just one theory. Um, they have noticed when they do this embolization in, in men with BPH and varicose seals that the BPH uh, is, is limited. I just, yeah, just haven't done the, the HCG in, in a year, and sexual function is still very, very good. It's, it's absolutely fine. But, you know, you, I think there is something to, you know, some of the studies, they, they talk about even penis enhancement with HCG. I think you get some sort of stimulation, blood flow in those organs. And when yeah. you have intratesticular testosterone, I think there may, may be some, some benefit. And we've got lots of our patients on it. I had been on it for many years. I've also been on many years off of it. You know, and maybe you feel better sexually on the HCG could be due to you know, elevations of estrogens, both intratesticularly and, and otherwise, not to mention the blood flow uh, to, to the sex organs. Why is it about, I just go back to the to testosterone propionate, uh, that some people are fearful of? Uh, besides, we, we talked about the you know this PIP or post injection pain. What I'm finding interesting is there's a big push on the what we call microdosing, right? And and people are getting really tiny, 10, 15, 12 milligrams daily of, of, of testosterone cypionate. Now, if you're doing something daily, right, you, you don't need to use the ester that's going to stick around the longest because you're kind of building on itself, and it's it's harder. You kind of want it to clear. You wanted it to you know go up, go down, and clear clear somewhat. You know, even though if you're going every day with a testosterone propionate, you're, you're know, still going to have a little bit of a building of an effect in reaching a steady state. So I just always found it bizarre that it's okay to do a long, longer lasting ester like cypionate daily, even though a smaller dose, when we've got very small amounts in a 25 milligram ampule that are available to do in, you know, from, you know, five to 25. And, and why not use that as part of your Daily dosing. And for those who use subcutaneous, I will talk to you about the difference between IM and subcutaneous, because this is another big one that comes up in the clinic. And, sure. You know, 0 0.5 mils is probably the largest size, give or take around there, that you'd probably want to inject subcutaneously. And obviously, the choice that so many people gravitate towards when they think of subcut is into the abs. Thanks to our friend, Dr. Krizla, the late Dr. Krizla had demonstrated that it's probably about, you know, five, six years back, you know, going into his abdominals with. Uh, with this, but there are other locations for subcutaneous injections, or you know, I think is better is uh, a shallow intramuscular injection. People are skeptical, and they, we can start talking about the differences between subcut and IM. At the moment, there is uh, a global shortage of commercially available testosterone cypionate. 
And uh, it, it keeps happening. It seems like it happens all the time around the Olympics. Uh, I mean, apparently in the That's US, point yeah, yeah, I know. It, it has happened once before. Um, in, in the US, some pharmaceuticals pulled out. Sippler is no longer making it. There's, uh, Pfizer, for some reason, is having production issues due to increased global demand, especially in, in the US. So um, mm -hmm. in, in the US, yes, you've got compounding uh, pharmacies and we can't really have that for injectables here in the UK, only for you know creams and, and, and capsules. So it has, we, we do import testosterone and cypionate from both the USA and, uh, and from Spain. Uh, Spain, it comes in a more dilute 100 milligrams in two milliliters in an ampule or 250 milligrams in two milliliters in an ampule. And the uh, testosterone, they actually, with some of the brands that are shipped in from the US are actually manufactured in uh, Portugal or Spain, believe it or not. And then they get shipped to the US with a license under the uh, FDA and and approved by the, uh, not the Home Office, the DEA. But it's, it's, very, it's a very complex and convoluted way for us to have to import in the, uh, the, the American brand of multi-dose vials. And, just, and a lot of guys just love the, the multi-dose vials, especially in the UK. And my argument's always been, well, you know, your, your whole month's supply is, or two or three is kind of stuck in that vial. Wouldn't mm. it be better to have you know, one fresh dose for every time you need to do the injection? And so I, it just... You know, we're trying to accommodate for whatever people need. I'm not trying to push people down one path or the other, but I think in times of shortage, there needs to be alternatives that people can look mm -hmm. at and feel confident in, to know that, uh, that you, you can uh, you know, trial these. And I've always found that, and let me know what you think, that the, the, best, uh, the best option is actually called rule number one of TRT, never go without your testosterone. So as long as you've got some testosterone in the system, at some point, even if you go maybe a few days to a week or without, as long as you're continuously doing it, you're not going to fall back to those levels because there's a psychology amongst men that they yeah. revert to thinking back to how they were when they were really, really poorly, when they, they weren't on TRT, and they're so afraid to ever go back there. I think it's just human nature. And so the moment the testosterone is not there, for whatever reason, for a week, you know, people panic. So I'm thinking it's you know, maybe making this video maybe can reassure people that you're in the event of shortages or the unavailability, or even just if something's not working right in your protocol, uh, maybe it's time to try something a little bit more radical. Test prop uh, either every other day or, or daily, uh, I think is, is a good option for our patients. I, I, is, when I first started taking it, I've, I noticed some, some mild improvements. I've been on TRT, and I think everyone knows that we watched my channel probably about 28 years. And you said forward to testosterone, I was, on TRT before everyone or anyone was even calling it TRT. Mm -hmm. uh, before it's cool. So I, 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 I've seen it quite a bit of it, really, really all of it. And I've tried nearly all the esters with the exception of undecking the weight uh, as, as a Vid or, or Navido in the, in, the, in the UK. It's only in Europe. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've had some, again, when you can't get your testosterone, some patients may benefit from weekly doses of 1 ml of, uh, mm -hmm. because it comes to uh, like 1,000 milligrams in a four ml injection, which is quite a large injection size. Oh yeah. Um, and then you have to be careful that you're not going to have some sort of anaphylactic shock. And so you have to be monitored and you have to go into a clinic to have it done. So, which is, which is an ideal. I, I want to talk to you about this subcuts versus IM versus shallow IM, which are kind of, kind of the same, same side of the same coin, but, but slightly different. My understanding. And for years, I, I don't know what it is. I tried subcut. I mean, believe it or not, I've tried subcut years ago before, again, it was even popular. I you tried it in my, in my abs. And there's nothing worse than you do a subcutaneous injection and you get that nasty bruise, hematoma, or, or, or worse, uh, that just doesn't go away for about two or three weeks. And imagine if you were to take your shirt off on the beach or around the pool, then it's just not a nice look, right? And to do that, and you never know when it's going to happen, even with the best injectors like myself, it, it, it happened. It, it absolutely happened. And I've seen pictures where someone go on a Facebook group that posted a picture of their, um, almost like an abscess in their abs from doing a subcut injection. And Facebook cited me because they thought it was pornography. They thought it was actually like a, a woman's boob or, you know, it's no, a that's how, how massive it was. And so... So that's my experience, experience with some cutaneous. I thought, well, if you could do a shallow intramuscular, it, it is a reason why people feel they can do the subcut is because it's uh, less intimidating for those who are ne needle phobic and it's a smaller looking needle or, or they have more control because they can look at it in, in, their, in their abs in particular because that's the place people gravitate towards. 
for years, I, I kind of avoided it a few times. I tried it in, in, in the daily routine for me now, it's, you know, twice or quality, quality yeah. But it's a one mil volume. So like I said, our test prop comes in on oh, 0 0.9 mils or so. Um, yeah. But it's not that big of a deal. And that was, that was the other bit. Uh, we get a lot of volume phobes, I call them. People who are feeling full of the volume that they're injecting. And I can't quite understand the, the, the logic behind it because there's still one mil is quite a small amount. Even two mils in the grand scheme of things, depending on how often you inject it. It's, it's getting in there, and there's something to be said for accuracy of measurement when you have a larger volume. I mean, the one and two milliliters I was referring to was intramuscular, shallow intramuscular. On yeah, back okay. on the sub on the subcut, yeah, because we would never recommend more than half a mil. No more than half a mil of, of a subcutaneous yeah. injection, and that's kind of what yeah. you see on the package leaflet for the Ziostead product, which is actually intended to be given once a week uh, as as a dose rather than every day or every other day. of uh, Ziostead, which is testosterone mm -hmm. enanthate without a preservative, which is intended mm -hmm. and studied for, in, for shallow and for subcutaneous okay. injections. And if you look at the graphs, if you look at the graphs for it, what do you see on a 75 milligram and 100 milligram dose? The, the dose that you would expect from an IM uh, would normally be higher, but from the Ziostead studies, they're much lower. They're almost like the levels of a testosterone cream, or not in cream, yeah. a testosterone gel. Yeah. And so yeah. in my sense that uh, subcutaneous is almost an inefficient route, you may as well go to a topical if you're going to do subcutaneous. Uh, with the other caveat is that in your mind, it's gone through the skin barrier, and now you know it's in your body rather than on your body, because not everyone can in, in visualize what the cream is doing, you know, because it creates a reservoir under the, under the skin in the, in the capillary bed, but not people can't visualize that. But when you put the needle in you subcutaneously, you know it's, it's gone in, and now you feel like you've got peace of mind, and that's not going to wash off when you go swimming or, really? or, or stretching. Yeah. Right? So, I've seen levels that are very unexpected compared to I am. And yeah. we've seen patients that uh, sometimes, and I think you alluded to it earlier, where they'll get a sudden spike of, of, of testosterone when you wouldn't expect yeah. it. And other times they look far too low from, from where they should be. Or, or then maybe you get more um, of the estrogenic effect from, and some would argue why not to do subcutaneous because you may get more uh, Estradiol from, from a given amount of sub, subcutaneous injection. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to watch our other videos on topics around HRT and TRT, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And until next time, stay in good health. This is Mike from Balance My Hormones.